we're kind of left that for a moment, but we'll come back to it when we're done looking at what Jesus Christ did. And what we're seeing is in verses 6, 7, and 8, what we call the condensation of Christ. Uh, some call it the, well, Schofield calls it the self-humiliation, self-humbling. Uh, but, but it's where Jesus Christ stooped down to become our Savior. And, uh, and then as a result of that, verses 9, 10, and 11, how God has highly exalted him. Each one can be broken down into seven steps. Seven steps down, seven steps of exaltation. And uh, we began to look in detail of these because we said in order for us to have the mind of Christ, we need to actually think through these. We can read real fast, and even when you read real fast, you're just uh, left in awe of what Jesus Christ did uh, to become our Savior. Uh, but at the same time, if you stop and reflect upon it, it can dwell in your mind and your heart. And then we can be challenged again that when things happen in our life that could get us angry and cause us to get off track spiritually, uh, to maybe even separate from brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, that we can, be we can take the admonition here of let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and get past that silly nonsense. And, uh, and get along as brothers and sisters and get busy for the Lord is really what the book of Philippians is all about. But uh, we started verse 6 starts out where Jesus Christ, it's the platform from which he left, equal with God. And he actually takes six steps downward. It's not really seven steps downward. He starts with a platform, that's the seventh, and then takes six steps downward. And those six steps are downward in order to become man's savior. Uh, Seven, the number of divine perfection. Six, the number of man. But, but that's what we see happening here. And we actually took that where we last week, we, we, we spent the first couple of weeks looking at what it meant to be in the form of God so that when he started stepping down into the universe to become our Savior, we'd appreciate those steps. So we actually start, looked at verses uh, 6 and 7 and studied uh, what we would call steps 1 through 5. Actually, we didn't send, say too much about uh, the step number 5. But it starts out this way. It says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now that's where he starts from. That's number one there. But, but made himself of no reputation. That's the first step down. And took upon him the form of a servant. There's three. And was made in the likeness of men. There's number four. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. There's number five. And became obedient unto death, there's number six. Even the death of the cross, there's number seven. And then from there, God highly exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. Let, let's just stop and have a word of prayer. Father, prepare us to see these verses, to reflect upon your Son, and to cry glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When... When, when you look at this, you know, my mind, I'm thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ because verse 5, it all centers around, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When you, when you start taking those steps downward, the first step downward is verse 7, uh, but made himself of no reputation. Made himself. Where we're going to pick up today, in verse 8, is being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Uh, everything that he did, the mind of Christ, he did this of his own free will. It was the will of God the Father, but he made himself of no reputation. Uh, he, being found as a fashion, as a man, he humbled himself. And then he becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So there's a sense in which when I'm studying this, I'm thinking about the mind of Christ. I'm looking at Christ, his mindset, what he was willing to do. That's what the context is. That's how we can start thinking about, especially the petty things that cause us to get mad at each other and, and realize, so what if someone offends you? You know, look, look what Christ was able to put up with for us. And, uh, and he did it for our sake. And so we can do it for other people's sake too. That's kind of the, that, well, that is the context there. But I was looking at it from Christ's point of view, but uh, there's another way of looking at that. You could think about Christ and his mind and then what he did by his own choice of volition. But you can also look at these verses and realize what an entrance into humanity. What, what a, what a, a focal point of all human history. <laughs> From man's point of view, Jesus Christ, who was in the form of God, equal with God, took on the form of, of mankind and entered into the universe, entered into man's existence, entered into the earth, walked the earth. I mean, it's the, 
the center point of all the history of mankind, even though there's still history yet to be done. But when it's all done, when eternity future, the very center of all time is going to center in Jesus Christ when He came into the world to die on the cross for man's sin. That's the means by which all men will have eternity future with God. And, uh, and so, when you, it, what, a, what a point in human history when these events took place. Uh, and, and, and it all took place because of the mindset that Jesus Christ had. First, He made Himself of no reputation. Made Himself. <laughs> He's the only real self-made man, isn't he? Because, you know, he created all things. He made himself of no reputation. But, but when, when he made himself, when you think about that, you know, people who brag that they're self-made men, one, somebody come along and said, the problem with self-made men, they usually worship their creator. And, uh, but, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the truly the one who's a self-made man, and he came to supply our salvation. And, and then, and so we, we studied how uh, the first step, the first, he's equal with God, then made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. He didn't come as a king, he came as a servant. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He was made in the likeness of men. He looked like man, and we made the point, it looked like sinful flesh. That is, he suffered all the things that you suffer in your flesh, because he had flesh that had nerve ends to it, and suffered pains. And, uh, and we're joking, not really joking, but we're talking about the, the Lord and how the Bible says that Satan would bruise his heel. And on the cross, he felt the pain of that cross. And so he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And that, that's where we pick up today, that being found as a, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Because that's one thing that man cannot do. Man naturally is full of pride. Man loves himself. And the, and the reason that there is offenses that you know, people offend one another, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. And it's really the pride of man that causes all the frictions and the problems. It's usually not over doctrinal things. Those things can be even disagreed and separated from without all the contention that, that, that sometimes comes up. Uh, sometimes there's a, a fight for the faith, and that's important. But, but the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came and found himself in the fashion as a man, he then humbled himself. Self-humiliation, self-humbling. And, uh, and, and that's something we're told in the passage that we need to practice, but it's not something we practice too easily because man is always protecting himself and, and, and certainly the opposite of that. Pride is the number one problem that man has. When Satan came to tempt Eve and, and Adam into sin, the, the sin, that, the way that Satan tempted them is he, he told Eve that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you should be like gods knowing good and evil. He attacked her sense of pride. You mean I can be more than what I am? I can be like the gods, and that's probably the angelic world that he's talking about, not God. Satan himself wanted to be God, and his number one sin that he had is pride. But that's exactly how he attacked man, and getting man to sin, he attacked him at his ego. The Bible says that the, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are the things that keep people from coming to Jesus Christ. These are the things that draw us into the world. And pride is the number one sin that man has, and it's the number one sin that man can't overcome. The Lord Jesus Christ, when He found Himself fashioned as a man, He humbled Himself. He did something that you and I can't do. Now, there's times in your life you can humble yourself and you know, swallow your pride, as we say it. But he did that constantly. I mean, think of who he is. We start out in verse 6, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Then he takes the abuse of the Pharisees, the abuse of Rome. He pays his taxes, submitting himself to the Roman government. He walked this earth. He humbled himself in everything that he did, being obedient to the Father. When you talk about the number one response, the number one sin of man is pride. Just think of what the first law that God gave the man is. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yet 99.99% of the time we put ourselves before God all the time. And you think about it. How often in your life does God always have preeminence? We're always worried about ourselves, and then every once in a while we think about God. Sometimes we make a decision and think about God. 
Uh, sometimes, though, we, we know to start, before we make that decision, think about God. But most of our life is centered around ourselves, And God said, Thou shalt have no other God before me. And we become our own gods most of the time. Even as believers. Because we don't humble ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ, He humbled Himself when He came. <laughs> There's uh, J. Vernon McGee in his little commentary uh, on, the, on this passage. He, he has a little note he, uh, that uh, John Wesley, when he... Uh, you know, John Wesley, interesting fellow, by the way, that, you know, when he first came to evangelize from England over to America, he wasn't even saved. He just part of the Anglican church that didn't really understand the gospel. He was on his way home in a ship, and he met an evangelist who told him about the cross work of Christ. When John Wesley came back the second time, he's, the, by the way, the, fa the father of the Methodist church. The Methodist church used to be the fundamentalists of the day until they just kind of stayed neutral where they're at. But... But at, the, at, at, at one time when John Wesley was, came to America and was evangelizing, and what he, what he was known for, the reason it's called Methodist, is he wasn't interested in the high church. He would just get ordinary people, get them saved, get someone studying the Bible, point them at as an elder, and that was his method of starting churches. So they were called Methodists. <laughs> but anyhow, he, when he was here one time, you know, he, he's evangelizing and all, and he came to this bridge, and it was such a narrow bridge that not just a one car, one lane bridge, it was a one man bridge. Only one person could cross the bridge at a time. And, and lo and behold, coming the opposite direction was a liberal preacher who knew John Wesley's testimony. And the liberal preacher spoke out and he says to him, he says, uh, I better say it the right way. He says, I never give way to fools. And John Wesley smiled at him, stepped to the side and said, I always do. <laughs> now, I'm trying to figure out, was John Wesley humble or was he full of pride on that one? <laughs> I'm a better man than you are. <laughs> That's what I mean. You can't... How, how do you divorce pride from the human nature of man? But Jesus Christ, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Uh, come look at a passage of scripture. I think it's, it's Nebuchadnezzar in and, and a place that he couldn't handle in his human nature, but I don't think we can handle success in our human nature either. Come over to uh, uh, Daniel chapter 4. When the Apostle Paul said later in Philippians, I've learned how to be a base and how to abound, that's a spiritual lesson. I don't think we really know how to abound, especially if we're not saved and without the Spirit of God in us. Nebuchadnezzar was in such a place. God, God actually gave his people, the nation of Israel, in, his, in their land over to Nebuchadnezzar. He has a judgment upon the nation of Israel. And that's the way Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel. Otherwise, he could have never conquered Israel because they were God's people. But Nebuchadnezzar, not being a pagan king, thought of himself as the one who really accomplished all things. And God gave him a dream and a warning. And even after he had a dream and the warning, he still had the thought that God warned him not to have. And here's his thought in verse 30. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30, it says, The king spake and said... Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of, of the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Isn't this great Babylon? I did it by my power and for my majesty. I mean, he's king. He's actually the first world dictator, ruler. He had conquered the world by, by God putting the Israel into, into his hands. The kingdom, the, this began the, the times of the Gentiles that end with the Antichrist and Jesus Christ destroying him and then taking his rightful place in this world. But Nebuchadnezzar, he's got that, he's just filled with pride. I mean, he looks out, all that he's accomplished, and it's all his honor, his power, his majesty, and he did it all. Did I not do that? God warned him not to be lifted up in pride. And the warning was that the moment you do that, you're going to be driven into a, as a wild maniac living out, out in a field as, as if you're an animal. And his hair actually got like feathered. There's actually a disease that some people try to say what he had. I can't even pronounce the name of this disease. But Nebuchadnezzar, as soon as he said that, he went insane. And for seven years, he ate like an animal, running through the woods, just insane. And God did that to prove something, to teach him something. Verse 34, watch him come to himself. 
It says, And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he, hath, he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What dost thou? Think Nebuchadnezzar learned a lesson? I did this by my power, my majesty. Now he's exalting the God of heaven who warned him that you have this thought, I'm going to drive you nuts. And he did. And, and then it says in verse 36, it says, uh, And the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and lords sought unto me, and I was uh, uh, established in my kingdom, and, and, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Probably humility, huh? And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are true and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. God's able. That's what the tribulation is all about. Did you notice he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven? He's not the king of earth, is he? He's not the king of earth till Jesus Christ comes back, destroying the Antichrist. And in, what the tribulation is all about is Jesus Christ putting down all the high and lofty looks of man and destroying him along with the devil and the, and the satanic kingdom, and Jesus Christ coming to establish his kingdom on this earth. But before he could do all that, Jesus was found in fashion as a man, and he humbled himself. He's the only one capable of doing such things like that. So, going back to Philippians, being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Now, humbling himself, he becomes obedient unto death that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to the cross. And as he's going to the cross, he's obeying the will of the Father. Uh, come to uh, Mark chapter 10. Now, there's several passages here as, as the Lord is going to the cross. When you read the, the gospel accounts, you, you catch on to something. Uh, I'll just tell you what it says in Luke. It, it says, at, at this very point that we're going to read out in the book of Mark, the way Luke writes it, it says, he set his face as, he, as if he would go to Jerusalem. And what you're talking about there is there came a time in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he's ministering in Galilee, down in Judea, finally back up in Galilee, where most of his time is spent. But there comes a time, and that's after he's ministered three years, he set his face toward Jerusalem, meaning you couldn't turn him. He's on his way. In fact, the very passage in Luke says that he sent some people to prepare, him, prepare a night stay for him there in, in Samaria because he, he's going straight to Jerusalem. He's going to cut through Samaria. But when the Samaritans realized he wasn't going to stay, they refused to let him come through. <laughs> and that's where James and John said, you want us to ask lightning come down, fire come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> and Jesus Christ said, you don't know what you're asking. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to, to save them, not to judge them at that time. But, but the, he had his face set that way. Now, when you, when you read this passage in Mark, you'll understand why, why, understand why it says this. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. It says, And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem... Jesus went before them, and they were ashamed and said, uh, amazed, excuse me, <laughs> they were amazed and said as they followed th that they were, and as they followed, they were afraid. I get the statement right. Again, it says, and they, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Now, the reason they're afraid, they know he's not like down in Jerusalem. But, you know, you get the idea that he's walking fast. And they're kind of lingering behind because they're scared. They said to him before, oh, we'll even die for you. Well, wait a minute. Why? No hurry to get down to Jerusalem, is there? <laughs> but he set his face to get there. And he's, he's at a fast clip. Because he has come to be obedient unto death. The time has come for him to die. 
when he says in John, you know, don't turn there, John chapter 12, it says, and not, he, he admits this, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus Christ, it's time to die, and he's going to be obedient. He's not a slow servant. He's moving, nothing's going to deter him, nothing's going to stop him. He's on his way to Jerusalem, he's got to keep a time. There's a time he's going to die, there's a place he's going to die, and it's now that time, and he's got to get to that place, and he's going to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ is on his way to Jerusalem to fulfill what, what God has called him to do. He's going to be obedient unto his Father. Now, you're probably familiar with this, but it's, he's actually becoming the fulfillment of a type that's back in Genesis chapter 22. Go back to Genesis 22. He became obedient unto death. That is, it's the Father's will for Jesus Christ to die. Oh, you know, I, you go ahead, Genesis 22. Let me finish reading what I should have read in Mark. Um, it, Mark uh, says in chapter 10, verse 34, it says, um, or verse 33, he, he began to prepare his apostles, saying, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and scourge him, and spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. So he doesn't hold anything back. Here's what, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen when I get there. He's becoming obedient unto death. The obedience is the obedience to God the Father. God gave his son. Gave his son to die on the cross, and it's now the time and the place for Jesus to go and die, and so he's being that obedient son to his father. The type is back here in Genesis 22 where God told Abraham after waiting till he's 100 years old to finally have the son of God's promise uh, and then sent away the son that wasn't the son of God's promise that God all of a sudden calls on Abraham to do something and there's a picture of Abraham and Isaac which is a picture of God the Father and God the Son. It says in Genesis 22 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offerings upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Mor Moriah is a territory that's later called Jerusalem. And there is a particular mount in that territory that, that Abraham is going to fulfill this on. That mount, we call it Mount Calvary. But Abraham is supposed to go to this area and there take the son that he's been now waited. You know, he's now, I forget how old Isaac is at this point, but he's in, like in his 20s or th at least 13 or 14. And, and so Abraham's well into years. He finally has the son that God promised him and God says, Now take that son and offer him there as a sacrifice. Abraham is going to fulfill God's will because Abraham is going to be a type of God the Father who is willing to give up his son, his only son, his beloved son, as a sacrifice for sin. Abraham becomes a type of God the Father, willing to do that. And then Jesus Christ then is the, is the fulfillment of the type of Isaac, the, the obedient son. Jesus Christ was obedient unto death. And, and as they go to this place, look at verse 6. It says, And Abraham took the a wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. So Isaac's going to carry the wood up the mountain called Calvary that God has picked to be a sacrifice for sin. But Isaac has a question for his dad, verse 7. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Father, my father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham, verse 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now Isaac, we're not even going to read the verses. They're going, to lay, they're going to build the altar, and then Abraham's going to say, lay down, son. 
and he's going to, Isaac is going to be obedient to his father and lay down on the altar and ready for his father to kill and sacrifice him. That's the obedient son. But, but it, verse 8, it's an interesting verse. I wanted to read this in other translations so I could see what they do about it because I don't like other translations and I'm sure they murder the verse. But I didn't prove it because I didn't read it at the time. The reason I say that to you, it reads odd there. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. It didn't say he will provide a lamb himself. That's how I'd say it. But I'm not God and I wouldn't do what God did here. It says God will provide himself a lamb. Jesus Christ was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to equal with God, but became fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Jesus Christ is the lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. He, he, Jesus Christ was the lamb. And, and Abraham made a statement here that's actually the fulfillment because Isaac, while he lays down on that altar willing to become the sacrifice that God said that Abraham was to offer, when you get down to verse uh, um, 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Now the verse before, Abraham's ready to come down with a dagger and kill his son. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon thy lad, neither do, the, do, do thou anything to him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, uh, behind him, uh, a ram caught in the thicket uh, by his horn. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Substitute payment. But it's greater than that. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. I got familiar with that phrase all through Bible college because every time you, there's always a, in Bible college, everyone was broke. And so sometimes on the student bulletin board, someone would post a little envelope with your name on it. You'd never know who did it. And they'd give you some money. It was a common thing. And it would always put Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. But a lot better than money. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said, it, to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. The fulfillment of Isaac is the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Abraham was the father willing to give up his son, his only son, his beloved son. Isaac, the only son, was willing to obey his father and become obedient unto death. Only it didn't get carried out, did it? But in the case of God the Father and God the Son, there's no angel that said, hold it. There was the complete fulfillment. God the Father fully, willingly gave His Son to die and gave Him up on the cross for us. And Jesus Christ, the obedient Son, He was obedient unto death. The last thing we'll learn about is even the death of the cross. And, and in that mount, as that verse says, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What shall be seen? Jehovah Jireh. The Lord's provision. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. The very place is where Jesus Christ died on the cross and became a, came the payment for our sin. So he became obedient unto death. And that's why you know that when, the, when Jesus Christ was in the garden, knowing that he was on his way to the cross, he said, Father, if there's any other way to do this, but if not, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus Christ became obedient unto death. He got up and said, let's go. Because that was the will of the Father. And Jesus Christ went to the cross, being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, when we get to that last part, that's the number seven in our list of Philippians there. He became, being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, that's five. And became obedient unto death, that's number six. Number seven, even the death of the cross. He didn't just die a natural death. He didn't just die a simple death. He died what is called even the death of the cross. The cross is a disgraceful death. Look at Mark chapter 15. And this is where he hangs on the cross between two thieves. Understand when it says the death of the cross, when you talk about dying on a cross... That's a disgrace. That's not an honorable death. 
It's not a man laid on a grenade and saved his troops. This is a disgraceful death. He's, he's hanging on a cross between two thieves, it says in, in Mark 15, verse 24. And when, he, and when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots for them, but every, uh, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and, and, and they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Now that's a fact, but it's a mockery at this point. Here Jesus Christ on the cross between two thieves, the soldiers gambling for his clothes, so that means they stripped him naked before all to see. And, and, and then they, they mock that the fact that he's the king of the Jews. Verse 27, And with them they crucified two thieves, one on the right hand, the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus Christ took his place as a criminal, as a transgressor, a breaker of God's laws. And even here, a breaker of man's laws, even though he did break man's laws. But he died numbered with the transgressors. It says, and, and, they, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said to themselves, uh, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And, the, and, 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 they, uh, and, that they were, uh, and they that were crucified with him reviled him, uh, reviled him. That is, even the two thieves were agreeing with the scribes and the Pharisees. When we studied this, we realized, you know, there's a point that both thieves on the cross reviled Jesus Christ and mocked him while he's on the cross. The next verse says, And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land unto the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even the two thieves mocked him, but remember one of the thieves ended up repenting, didn't they? You know, after they got done mocking, and all of a sudden it becomes pitch dark in the middle of the day. All of a sudden one of those thieves said, wait a minute, this is the Son of God. He said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus Christ said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Took his place. Seconds ago he was mocking him. Set, just short 11 o'clock hour before his death, the guy got saved just in time because Jesus Christ was willing to save the man who was mocking next to him on the cross who rightfully deserved to be there. When he cried, Lama, Lama, la, uh, Eli, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabatnai, the reason that's in your Bible, why would it tell you, ar uh, that's not archaic, anyhow, the Aramaic, yes, it's not pure Hebrew, it's Aramaic. And, but why would, that, why would they tell you those words? It's so that the, everybody wonders, why did Jesus Christ cry that? It's so that you and I would realize something happened between Him and God the Father that we can't see. God the Father forsook Him. He cried it so we would know. He said it in the language of the people standing there so they would know something is happening. This darkness is not just human darkness. This is the wrath of God. This is hell itself being placed on Jesus Christ where He's dying for our sins. And God the Father, the glory of God, Jesus Christ, who was in the form of God, becomes a man, and God the Father turns away from God the Son. And in that darkness, Jesus Christ suffered what the Bible calls outer darkness. Separation from God, from the glory of God. Jesus Christ, at that point, is paying for our sins. And it's recorded there so that you would know. So that when it says, He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, He's suffering a disgraceful human death, but also a divine death. He's suffering a spiritual death, a separation from God the Father. He's, he's suffering hell for you and me. So he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's a, the, that verse in Hebrews we read last week. He, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Think of the first part of that verse. He, by the grace of God? This is the grace of God. In our behalf, right? He tasted death for, for us. There... 
you got to get two passages to appreciate it. And some of you, we've, we've talked about the cross of Christ, and so you know these verses, but they'll, ne they'll never, hopefully never stop to uh, just cause you to understand and to rejoice what Jesus Christ did for us. Get Galatians chapter 3 and Deuteronomy chapter 21. Get both passages before I read either one. Deuteronomy 20, 21 and Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Look, look at verse, start in verse 10. Galatians 3.10, it says, For as many as were, are of the works of the law, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the law. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. We ended last time by looking at the verse in John, uh, was it 8.29, that Jesus said, I always do those things that please my Father. Well, cursed is the man that continues not to do, continues not in all things, on the, on the, under the law to do them. None of us have done that. Jesus Christ did do that, but yet he ends up being cursed. Look at this, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. As it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he became a curse for us because we are cursed because we've never kept the law. But he kept the law, and so he wasn't cursed for himself. He was cursed for us. And then it refers to this passage back in Deuteronomy that says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. When Jesus Christ died, how did he die? The death of the cross. They hung him on a tree. And that's an exceptional death in the sense, even the death of the cross. Not only is it disgraceful, it's a cursed death. He was cursed of God the Father for us. Because he fulfilled, look at Deuteronomy 21. And the context of this is just amazing to me. Start in verse 21, uh, verse 18. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. It says, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son. Well, that's not Jesus Christ, is it? But if there was a stubborn and rebellious son, that's the rest of us, the sons of Adam. It says, which will not obey the voice of the father. Well, we haven't done that. Nor the voice of the mother. And that when they, they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Then shall the father and the mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city and unto the gate uh, of his place. And... And they shall say unto the elders of the city, Our son is a stubborn and, rebellion, uh, stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall you put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So that's how you get rid of rebellion. The, guy, the kid's never going to grow up to be a, uh, a criminal, because as a juvenile delinquent, he's going to die. And, uh, and so you're going to put the fear in the nation of Israel, but you're going to put, you're going to, that's the way you separate sin. That's why God has a place called hell. The people who will not trust Jesus Christ, will stay in rebellion against God, are going to be placed away from society in a lake of fire where they're going to be punished. But anyhow, that's what you do with a disobedient son. But watch verse 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree... Now that's taken, you know what, what that means is, you know, you stone the guy to death, but some guys are just so rebellious that you've got to make a, 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 a real example out of this guy, so that once you stone him and you put him to death, you hang him up on a tree for everybody to see. Because this guy, you want to show that you cannot do the things that this person does and get away with it. So if he sins so, so severely that you have to hang him on a tree, it says in verse 23, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree. Did Jesus Christ's body stay on the cross all night? No, they took him down by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
it says, but thou shalt be in any but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that it, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, and the land is defiled which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. The guy who hangs on the tree is what? Cursed, accursed of God. That's why it says over there, Jesus Christ became a curse for us. He hung on a tree. He, Jesus Christ became obedient unto death. Not just death, even the death of the cross. Where there He dies and suffers hell for us, the payment of our sin. Where He is forsaken of God the Father, accursed of God the Father, and dies for our sin. There's another picture from the Old Testament I'd like to share with you. You've got to get another two passages of Scripture. Get John chapter 3 and get Deuteronomy chapter 21. Not Deuteronomy. <laughs> that was the other one. Numbers chapter 21. Get these two passages. Numbers chapter 21. And John chapter 3. You say, oh, I'm familiar with John chapter 3. You're probably familiar with verse 16, aren't you? Probably not at all familiar with verse 14. Maybe this will become your new favorite verse. Now, before I read either one of those two passages, I'll just quote to you the message that we have to preach to the world. The message is called the, mess, the word of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God hath made Christ to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus Christ had no sin. God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now you get the smaller words. God made Christ to be sin for us. He became the very personification of our sin. God didn't just put our sin on Him, He made Him sin. Not to practice sin, he made him the personification of sin. I want you to see to what degree that Jesus Christ became the personification of sin by looking at Numbers chapter 21 and verse 8. Now this is the context, hopefully you're familiar, Israel's in the wilderness and Moses keeps giving them, God gives them manna from heaven, but the people keep complaining, everything. And, and now all of a sudden they're, no, they're not happy with manna no more. They don't want God's bread from heaven. They want to have onions and leeks and garlic, the stuff they used to eat in, in Egypt. And when, God got, when they were no longer satisfied with God's provision, God got angry with them. 21, Numbers 21, verse 8, and it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make a fire... Oh, wait a minute. I, should, I have to tell you what happened first. Well, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people... And, and they bit the people, and much people, of, much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, <laughs> for we have, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Put a, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent bit any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now God didn't take the serpents away. But he says if you get bit by a serpent, Moses is going to take a serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up, put it somewhere in the congregation there. And someone gets bit, before that poison takes effect, you run and you look at that brass serpent on the pole. If you look at it, you'll live. Now that's how God spared them from dying from the plague of that. John chapter 3, in verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You talk about the personification of sin, what is a serpent? But Satan himself, the father of murder, the father of lies, the one who led this earth into rebellion. 
Jesus Christ didn't die for angels. He didn't die for Satan. But he took on Satan, and Jesus Christ lifted up on that cross. is just like the serpent on the pole that Moses lifted up. Jesus Christ was the complete payment of a sin, destroyed the power of the devil, so that all mankind could be saved and have everlasting life. To those who look to him. Now we know what it means to look to him beyond what's written here in John by understanding the work of the cross that Jesus Christ became a curse for us God made him to be sin for us he's the personification of sin he's the very root of sin he took on the very rebellion of Satan rebellion in the world and Jesus Christ died there for our sins started out he was in the form of God not robbery to be equal with God all the way down to the place where he becomes obedient unto death even the death of the cross a holy God dying a cursed, sinful death, a serpent on a pole for mankind. That's the mind of Christ. Now we know that's not the end of the story, praise the Lord. <laughs> He's raised from the dead, not just raised, highly exalted. We'll start the study of the exaltation of Christ next week with a reminder of Jesus Christ stepping down this far is a reminder that you and I need to have that kind of mindset when it comes to our relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll remind you of that again next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the privilege to study about your Son, to know about it, uh, for the fact that He did it, to trust in it, to be a part of that everlasting life that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful Savior. We thank you for your willingness to give your Son, for His obedience to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Father, we thank you that you rose him from the, raised him from the dead for our justification and exalted him that he might be Lord of Lord, King of Kings, head of all things in heaven and earth, and that we get to be a part of that eternal reign. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you turn again to number 89 if you need it? Just going to sing, stand and sing the chorus.